866-762-9238. That's 866-762-9238. You can also go to their website at www.enerfood.com. That's E-N-E-R. F like Frank, O O D like dog dot com, enterfood.com. A big thank you to all of our listeners already taking the products that Enter Health offers. We truly appreciate it. We thank you for your support and encourage you to listen often to stay informed during these crucial times. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is 7-18-2013, Thursday night. It's a live broadcast. And I tell you, everything that's being done, everything that is being promulgated, everything that's being fomented in the media, everything is just leading to and leading up to a total conflict, a chaos, ordo ab chaos. Out of the chaos comes the order, or from the chaos comes the order. This is the, basically, the Illuminati's watchword, their little phrase, their Luciferian. It also would be the watchword of those who would take this nation or any other nation into a totalitarian state or into a tyrannical state, uh, which it is vast, uh, quickly approaching. We're already there. We're not going into it. It's already there. When I see in Texas, when I see in Texas a woman walking along the street in a neighborhood that she probably lived in, she's probably going for an evening walk or something such as that or an afternoon walk, and you have a policeman, you have a police officer, you know, alleged police officer, because I'll tell you, it's just a travesty. Let me see this guy's name here. San Marcos, Texas, Corporal James Angelo Palermo. Texas police officer been jailed after he assaulted a 22-year-old, Alexis Alpha, who had the audacity to walk by the scene of his traffic stop. So here's old Corporal Palermo. And basically, he uh, stops a uh, a car, a Toyota Prius, on May 29th this year at 1 a.m. for traveling the wrong way down a one-way street. Now, in that neighborhood, I don't know people walking 1 a.m., but I'll tell you, I've walked at 1 a.m. before. I've been out late at night in my neighborhood. I get up in the middle of the night. If I decide, I might go at 3 o'clock in the morning and go take a walk around the block. And, uh, you know, make it so I can sleep easier, wear myself out, whatever it might be. The fact of the matter is, is that here's this female pedestrian passes by, doesn't interfere, doesn't say diddly. And then basically Palermo starts questioning the woman, asking her why she was walking by his traffic stop. All he had to do is let her go out about her way. She wasn't asking him anything. She wasn't saying, excuse me. She wasn't, you know, doing anything. She wasn't videotaping. And although that's perfectly legal to do that, you can stand, uh, you know, over on the sidewalk while he's there. That's not a problem. You could be done. But she wasn't even doing that. She was walking by. So then he insisted she provide her identification. And then she said, what is it? Are you having some kind of a bad day? You know, calls him a dick. You know, what are you being a dick? You know. Uh, officer, you know, what's wrong with you? I'm just passing by here. He then grabs her and then slams her head down, teeth first, onto the front of a car, gives her a concussion and knocks all her teeth out of her mouth, the front teeth out, throws her to the ground and arrests her for a third-degree felony, obstruction, uh, resisting arrest, a Class A misdemeanor, and a public intoxication, a Class C misdemeanor. Police commander then Penny Dugan said Alpha was not guilty of any of those crimes and in Corporal Palermo had no reason to detain, and here it is, no reason to detain Ms. Alpha, nor did he ever develop probable cause to arrest her for any offense. However, Commander Dunn said 
Ms. Alva made no contact with either the driver or Corporal Palermo. She did not look at them as she walked by and made no suspicious movements, gestures, or comments that would indicate she was anything more than a passerby and appeared unaware of the actions either of the driver or, or Corporal Palermo. However, once Palermo's supervisor reviewed the case, the woman was released. She's been released, but shockingly, her charges have not been dropped. See, they want to use those against her and blackmail her or extort. San Marcos probably wants to extort a verdict. Anyway, Corporal James Palermo, you're now in aggravated assault with serious bodily injury by a public servant, which is a first-degree felony in connection with that incident. And, uh, you know, basically, it's a little college town there, and you think that in that college town there would be something more innocent. Well, that college town right there is the one where you're going to go if you're going to go into criminal justice or if you're going to go become a spy or you want to go to the FBI you want to go into the military and be a sneaky Pete or military intelligence, that's where you go to school at, is in San Marcos. But the fact is, ladies and gentlemen, this thing that is being done by police and the spirit all over the United States is getting to be beyond, you know, just beyond anything. Or the woman, I believe it was somewhere up there in Mission, Kansas, Mission, Kansas at a post office, she goes in there. She's a suburban soccer mom. She's got two kids in, you know, with her in the car. She takes them into the post office, going to mail daddy's parcel. Well, of course, it's right after the thing is closed, so she's using the thing in the lobby. But she sees somebody in there, in the room, you know, in the behind the glass, the locked doors, and she knocks on the window and says, you know, motions. Can you see them? Of course, the person in there ain't paying no attention to her or anything. So she really doesn't do anything. Maybe she knocks again, and that's about it. But she's not being belligerent, doing anything, or trying to break through the glass. She then calls her husband, kind of gets into an argument with him on the phone because he had the wrong information, as husbands might be wanting to do, on the package. However, then, unbeknownst to this woman, her children had gone outside and came in from outside, and they got a couple little pebbles outside by the doorway, and they put them down in the mail chute, which had nothing to do with the fact that the woman in the post office would not help her. It's just incredible. So then she goes out. She starts to put the kids. She does whatever she does to mail the package, changes whatever, puts it in the box thing. And then apparently the woman in the police uh, had been called by the woman in the post office there saying that this woman – she lied and said, this woman put rocks down the chute because I wouldn't help her. Well, she put, I guess, a few pebbles that the kids did. And then they said, well, could it be the kids? No, the kids are not able to do so. Well, then this thing is down video. But then here again, here's the case. Then all of a sudden you get a dyke, Nazi, female police officer who, get this, this is the thing that I'm starting to get at and what I'm really getting at the spirit of this thing. The police, the, the, the lady police officer comes up and says, give me your ID. I need to know who you are. And she's right up on her invading her space. All right. She, I want to see your ID. So the question then is asked by the woman, why do you need to see my ID? That then was construed to be noncompliance. Why do you need to see it? You could have, she could have said, am I being detained? Am I under arrest? Uh, you know, any of the type of statements that we would tell people to make at a car stop or anything to ascertain just what business the police have with you and what is their probable cause, etc. And then at that point in time, you know, you would ask, well, why do you need to see my ID? Or what is it? Instead, this Nazi... And I submit Dyke, female police officer, okay, then grabs her in an arm, arm halt, and then at the same time there's this goopy guy there with kind of like a, a weird stocking cap police officer on his head. I thought it was like the, the grunge police officer, you know. <laughs> it's just totally strange. And then the female police officer then gets her in an arm halt, and then throws her, starts taking her to the ground. 
And then the guy joins in the other female police officer, and they both take her to the ground. And then the guy and the female then land with their knee in the back of the this soccer mom who's got two babies screaming and crying in the back of her van. So I don't get this thing. I do get it because it is born of Lucifer. It is a spirit of lawlessness on the part of the police. Now, let's talk about it. another thing in terms of race. And I really didn't even really want to start here tonight, but it's just this thing is just getting to be overwhelming. The people in power are using Ordo Abkeo to destroy the last vestiges of any kind of semblance of law and order or even of freedom in the United States or liberty, let alone pursuit of happiness. You can't do that because nobody's got enough money. One percent or less of the people have enough money to do anything anymore. So you have this joker tut lizard. And all of his crew now are pushing race, 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 race relations. And then Holder, who should, Attorney General Holder should already be arrested as an accessory after the fact in several murders, including two Border Patrol agents, for his actions in the Fast and Furious gun running to the Mexican cartels, specifically targeting Chapo Guzman. Now, recently they got... Uh, um, uh, the, the Zetas head guy, the Zetas head guy, they got him arrested now. They picked him up. Mexican Marines picked him up, you know, uh, near uh, the Mexican side uh, of Nuevo Laredo. And basically, then they brought him in. But did you see the picture when they even brought him in? This guy is not in cuffs. The head of the Zeta cartel in Mexico is brought to the police station. He's not even in handcuffs as he's escorted in the perp walk by the Mexican Marines and police that are escorting him there. So you have the head of the Zeta cartel. Yet this woman in San Marcos, Texas, who just walked by, minding her own business, going home or wherever she was going from, maybe back to her dorm room or whatever, gets grabbed by Corporal Palermo and gets all her teeth knocked out in a massive concussion as he judo flips her with jiu-jitsu, MMA fighter flips her right under the car to take her to the ground under the rest. Whatever happened to the question, uh, you are under arrest, please put your hands behind your back. Put your left hand behind your back. Thank you. Put your right hand behind your back. Thank you. You're now under arrest. I'm taking you to the vehicle. Well, then the resisting arrest is if you even tense your muscles when somebody grabs you in reflex, then that's resisting arrest. So then they can, why didn't this uh, Palermo then taser this woman relentlessly? Why didn't he hook her up to the tasers and keep shocking her every 30 seconds and pulling the trigger again and again and again in an attempt to give her a heart attack? I think Corporal Palermo sitting in a freaking jail, you ought to be... You know, thinking more about these things, you should be killing these people. Every time you interact with somebody in your job, you should just kill those civilians. Because you get rid of all those civilians, you get rid of your bosses, you get rid of the politicians, then you and the drug dealers can have a heck of a world, can't you? You know? So are this woman in Kansas. Here you got the head of the Zeta cartel, not in cuffs. And you gotta, by golly, I'm gonna take her to the ground. She's in, well, what'd she do? She's in non-compliance. And then who shows up? It's like the Hollywood movie. Then you got Mr. I'm a muscle-bound sergeant, young, tough, Marine Corps, or ex this or that, or whatever, or wanna be, you know, bad boy sergeant, a ship supervisor in Mission, Kansas, with his hut, hut, hut you know, profile and the big muscle-bound arms. He's the steroid head in high school, probably. The steroid head who said, I'm going to take these and get big, get big, baby. And so they bring him, and then this poor lady, the suburban soccer mom, who she still doesn't even know that her kids put rocks down the mailbox, 
little kids, and I'm talking about little girls, just put a couple pebbles down it. It wasn't like giant rocks or, you know, shoveling the dirt into the federal facility. You know, it's just kids doing something stupid. Well, they still don't tell her about any of that, and then they have her down on the ground, and then this guy, old Sheriff Musclebound, or a Sergeant Musclebound, comes up and puts his genitals within about four to five inches of her face, and then he's just sort of lording it over, and she has to look up into his eyes like he's there at any time. He can make her comply with the sexual act because he has the sheriff, or the he has the sergeant's power over this woman on a street situation where his dyke female officer took her down to the ground for non-compliance for asking, why do you need to see my ID? Do you see the juxtaposition and the hence the anger? Well, maybe I should just read at this point in time two things right here. So Corporal Palermo, you know, and all the other guys, you know, there are, there's times when uh, there are people on the street that deserve a trimming, as they used to call it in Chicago. There's a time when you when you you know when a, when a, uh, somebody deserves a trimming, but this ain't no time to deserve a trimming when you got some woman who's uh, walking by, or you got a soccer mom who then they threaten to take her kids away because her husband wouldn't answer the phone. Yet she said, well, I gave the phone number to the officer here, but he refused to take it. So then you see even on the tape, she said, well, we said, well, what, you didn't give me the number. He said, well, here's the number. It's 91-whatever, blah, 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 86-whatever, you know. And then he says, oh, I don't have any pen. I'm sorry. I can't listen to it. And he does that three times. And they said, well, your husband didn't come. Well, they never called him. So once they did call him, after they're threatening her and all this stuff, now he comes, he's pretty pretty angry, and then they comment on him how he's not playing the game and coming. He's trying to ask why, just why it is you're arrested. He's, he's not in compliance, and he's giving us trouble. Yeah, when you're Nazis, cops, when you're Nazis, and somebody questions whether or not you're a Nazi or not, then yeah, you might be going to get some trouble. And I'm going to tell you, I'm tired of all of it. And I would assert and tell people out there to no longer have any compliance, no longer cooperate voluntarily, no longer cooperate voluntarily with any law enforcement, any federal agency, anything. Because if you do, all they're going to do is ramrod you and roll, lord you over and the whole nine yards, so you might as well keep your mouth shut Tell them that you don't speak to anybody without counsel and then ask them if you're under arrest. If they then want to beat you or kill you, then they will have their just dues. When the archangels and the angels come at the behest of Lord Jesus and jerk you out like the tear worker of iniquities that you are. And here's what I have to say. Once a government is committed to the principle of silencing the voice of opposition, it has only one way to go, and that is down the path of increasingly repressive measures until it becomes a source of terror to all its citizens and creates a country where everyone lives in fear. You didn't comply. You asked me a question. How dare you ask me a question? I'm Mr. Street Thug. I'm the baddest street gang in the world. I always remember I used to go to this joint. Anybody lives in uh, uh, St. Louis knows where Page Boulevard is, etc. You also know that there is a uh, uh, joint used to be called uh, Jukebox uh, Saturday Night. And that one time a month, the uh, police, organized by one of the big state police undercovers or a rank, used to order a uh, real nice little dance like once a month. And they used to have a picture of the, like a lot of the St. Louis Police Department, they said the police department, biggest street gang in the world. Now, I used to like Officer Friendly, you know. I used to like Officer Friendly, and even all up and through the 60s and the riots and the whole darn things, all the unrest and campuses and stuff, I still liked Officer Friendly. And he was a little different than the guy from the 50s, that he was the guy that used to drive your dad home or your grandpa home if he had four beers instead of two. 
okay, or whatever it was, and drop him off, and then they said, put him to bed, and the car is up on the, you know, up uptown at such and such in front of the Ben Franklin store, you know. I like that guy the best because he was a peace officer and he kept the peace. Now, on the other hand, if there was some really hard duking, he didn't need no SWAT team. That was a guy with a mission, and he had a six-shooter with multiple uh, 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 fast uh, fast clips on it, you know, fast change, uh, moon, moon face clips. I forget the name of them. I just can't think of it. we got two of them sitting right above my head right now. And then uh, he had a nightstick and a blackjack. And uh, then he also had a 12-gauge pump in the car, you know, Remington or Winchester or whatever. And that guy right there by himself could take it on. I know people like uh, a marvelous peace officer is a friend of mine, Greg Ewinson, one of the most decorated state troopers in the state of Kansas. Well, Greg Ewinson took on bank robbers and stuff by himself. He was the only guy out in West Kansas or Central Kansas, only guy or law enforcement around, say, for 30, 40, 50 miles. And old Greg, you'd get his, uh, probably it was a 357, get it all stoked up and uh, get a 12-gauge, and he went after and took down bank robbers by himself. One man, one riot, one ranger, they used to say. And, boy, I just saw that old movie the other night. And uh, it gets me to another part of this issue. It was uh, with Nick Nolte playing um, Texas Ranger, Ben Teen. And then there was old uh, uh, Cash Bailey was the guy who he grew up with, who was the drug lord down in Mexico. And, uh, you know, that was uh, an interesting thing. But that also has a guy, Rip Torn, the actor who plays the local sheriff or marshal or, or policeman or whatever. And they get to talking about politicians early on, and Rip Torn has a line, I believe it goes something like this. He says, the uh, only thing lower than a child molester is a politician. And believe me, that is the case, because you're seeing these politicians now involved in promulgating this whole fascist, Gestapo, totalitarian, whatever it is, whatever, all the things these guys are doing. And Congress is complicit. There's a few people in Congress who are at least speaking against it, but they have no power because their blackberries are hacked. And then all of this nonsense, all of this nonsense. Remember we talked two weeks ago, I told you on air, about these guys that were seen, that were undercover or that were, playing, you know, cars, unmarked cars with the license plate readers going through and reading all the plates and taking pictures of the cars in all these corporate office parking lots and doctor's parks and, you know, clinics and, you know, just regular businesses in suburban area and taking pictures of everybody. And then the week later or two weeks later, same people that saw those people, it's just somebody's working early in the morning landscape crew, that they saw another one up in another town in that same suburban area. I guess it's on the, the Kansas side of Kansas City or whatever. And they saw them there in a city there, and they were doing the same exact thing. And now isn't it interesting that it's all now over, all over Drudge and that they're keeping all this stuff, you know, for a great deal of time forever, let's say. And I'm going to tell you and tell you more about this because every time they take a picture of your license plate, and your car, particularly at intersections, they're also taking a picture of you. They're taking a facial picture of you. You look up at those cameras, you drive up to the four-way stop or to the stoplight, and the cameras are up there pointing every direction. They're taking a picture of you, and they may even be able to get from that thing an iris scan uh, in some instances, or a retina scan from there, they certainly can get your face, your facial recognition, run through a software, and then everything about that position where you're at, your facial recognition, your license plate, the vehicle, etc., all of that then goes 
into their data collection funnels and is routed to the appropriate things to have algorithms or dossiers on you, dossiers on the car, dossiers on the license plate, and it's all, you know, crisscrossed and related to each other, you know. And then that is done not only for the local police and all of that, which they're talking about. All of this information, ladies and gentlemen, filters up as well to the NSA, the necrophiliacs, the necrophiliac Shiite arseholes. Now, that's A-R-S-E, okay? And that's what I think. And now they have the temerity to run their number two man. I guess General Alexander got tired of being told that he was lying or perjuring himself before Congress. And I guess he thought better about going before Congress and telling another lie. So he said his, what's this guy, Inglis, Inglis, Ingles, Inglis, whatever his name is here, Inglis. Let me see if I've got the paperwork here on it. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just hopping mad. Yeah, here he is right here. NSA admits it analyzes more people's data than previously revealed. Well, no, no, you know what, Sherlock? During testimony on Capitol Hill today, that was yesterday the 17th, a national security agency representative rather casually indicated that the government looks at data from a universe of far far more people than previously indicated. Chris Inglis, that's I-N-G-L-I-S, Inglis. Chris Inglis, the agency's deputy director. Hey, Inglis, you're, they brought you up because you're the good-natured, smiley boy, happy spook, aren't you? You're the happy spook. And I heard you, I saw some of your testimony and where somebody was trying to be mean to you, one of those big old mean Congress people being mean to you, saying, well, didn't you blah, 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 and didn't you say one thing and then collect a lot more, and didn't, and didn't you try to keep this secret from Congress and the American people? And then you just kind of laughingly said, yeah, we tried to do it, but we didn't do a very good job, did we? Ha, 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 ha. Old smiling happy spook to try to get along with them old mean Congress people. And then he said, but here's the deal. Most of the testimony largely echoed previous testimony by the agencies. Now oh, they're stopping Al-Qaeda, and they're stopping this and that. And, of course, you put the underwear bomber on the plane. The U.S. State Department or somebody or the spooks put him on the plane in Sheepole Airport, you know, and you got him all doped up on the cat or the kit or whatever you got him on, and then he's trying to light his underwear on fire on the plane. Meanwhile, he's under the observation of several federal marshals and a couple of your spooks to make sure that he – Maybe lights it and then it's stopped so you guys can get budgets and you can still continue to collect your crap on everybody and build Nazi, commie, fascist, whatever, dossiers, Stasi dossiers on every single man, woman, and child in America. Because you're scum. You're Luciferian scum. You hear me, Deputy Director Inglis? Inglis? Because then you said, Oh, analysts look at two or three hops hopping down the bunny trail from terror suspects when evaluating terror activity. Inglis revealed. Previously, the limit of house surveillance we extended had described as two hops. Now it's two or three, or maybe four or five bunny trail little hops. Ladies and gentlemen, they're spying on every man, woman, and children in the United States and potentially even in the world. We'll be back in a moment as we pause for this cause. With natural and man-made disasters and economic turmoil, if we don't get well prepared, we will most certainly regret it. Good readiness must include storage of high-quality food that will build us up rather than tear us down. Much of the storable food available is full of bad fats, salt, sugar, nutrient-poor refined foods, and even MSG. In response, EnterHealth Botanicals has created our 40-day and 40-night 100% organic preparedness pail. It's GMO-free and has a 10- to 20-year shelf life if stored at 60 degrees or less. 
Some of the items need cooking, some can be eaten dry, while some can be soaked and sprouted. These are selling out fast at third the price of storable food packages. Call us at 866-762-9238. That's 866-762-9238. Or go to enerfood.com, E-N-E-R-F-O-O-D.com. 866-762-9238. Or go to E-N-E-R-F-O-O-D.com. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Hawk on Survive to Thrive. And I will tell you what, if you'd like to get a discount on any of the items, the Inner Health Botanicals, and you can go to innerfood.com, as he said, E N E R F O O D.com. Or you can call 866-762-9238, 866-762-9238. You tell them Hawk sent you and you'll get a discount even over and above quality or quantity discounts on everything, I believe, including the herbal tinctures, the inner food, the Silmarin, all the different things, the Coca Mojos, all the products that are tremendous or the 30-day, 39 pails, or the 14-day survival pail, which is their new one, the 14-day survival pail, which I believe is $99.99 for the normal price point. It's all organic food. You can start out. You'll get a discount on all of it. You tell them Hawk sent you. That's the code word is Hawk. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me say this to you. If you've seen the articles and you're talking about you know, in uh, I believe on the uh, MSN on money, why the very old face of financial doomsday? Because Bernanke is keeping the interest rates down. The thing that just got me, you think everybody is doing so well, you know, the old people got all the cash. Well, Americans over 75 years old lost almost one-third of their financial assets from 2007 to 2010, according to the study from AARP, Public Policy Institute. On top of that, the group is adding on debt because they have to use their credit cards even at that age to be able to survive or to eat. Nearly 22%, 75 and older, carry credit card debt, and that's a rise from 18.8%, 75 or older, in 2007. And basically, you know, they might have some money, But you could have a million dollars in the bank, and you might only get 1% interest. You could go to 10 banks, put 100,000 in, you'd get 1% interest, maybe. Maybe not even that much. You cannot live on that. You cannot live on that even with a million dollars. So consequently, ladies and gentlemen, most people don't have it. And then all the working stiffs and all the people like me who fall between the cracks, you know, I have a health reasons, but I, you know, uh, I can't probably get disability, and I haven't tried to claim it because I'm trying to do what the Lord asked me to do and do all of this. And the only way I survive is by some assistance from those who listen. So the fact is, ladies and gentlemen, is that how does that fit in? Does that fit in, fall through the cracks, or what does it do? You know, well, am I ever going to retire? Are you out there working your, you know, two, three jobs ever going to be able to retire? You know, you had a business once upon a time. Business went bankrupt because, you know, everything moved out. Maybe they moved the factory out of your town. That took away all the other jobs. You had a job that you, you know, were a plumber or you built houses or you're a real estate agent or whatever it is. And all of this has been taken away. And now they've gone after the pension funds. They've kept the artificial interest rates low and given all that benefit to the banks so they can loan money to the super rich who then can run the stock market up to the highest doggone point it's ever been. And meanwhile, there's fewer people working in the United States than there were in the workforce 30 years ago. So when one of these rich guys say, oh, I think it's going pretty good, you tell them to shove it up their keister because I'll tell you what, the sun ain't shining up there. So we got that. And if you would like to get gold or silver, which V, 
and Steve Quayle has told you for years, I've told you, V, the former head trader of the Royal Bank of Scotland, has told you to get rid of all your paper, get rid of your bank stuff except for what you need to pay your monthly bills, keep it in there. Told you to get out of all the banks, out of the stocks, out of the bonds, and go into silver, gold, other precious metals, to go into farmland, which you can raise food on. And then he also told you to get long-term storage food, get that 40-day, 40-night pail, you know, or the or the 14-day uh, pail, whatever. Get whatever it is you need. Get that extra can of chunky soup like my my college buddy that did exactly what I told people to do was to, if you can just only afford to get one extra can of chunky soup or progresso or whatever it is, or spaghettios or whatever, and just put that back and you keep doing that once a week, once a week as you go to the store or how many every times you can afford to, pretty soon you're going to end up with a two month supply or three month supply. And while the Lord has forestalled the final judgment on America, but I don't think it's going to be forestalled much longer. It's only by your actions, your prayers, your intercessions that it's, it's being forestalled anyway. Now, if you'd like to get gold or silver, you call Steve Quayle at 406-586-4840. 406-586-4840. You call Steve, and while you're there, get his new book, True Legends, Tales of the Giants and the Plume Serpents. Uh, go ahead and get his other books, Age of Wars, Genetic Armageddon, all the Weather Wars, all those different books. You can go to stevequail.com. You can contact Steve and email him. Uh, also, you can email him at uh, qsr315 at gmail.com, qsr315 at gmail.com, or steve777 at stevequail.com. And those are at his website, or you can dial him at 406-586-4840. You tell him Hawk sent you. You tell him that Hawk sent you, and you tell him if you want gold or you want silver. If you email Steve, you tell him and, uh, what, what you want to get into, what you want to invest, and you give him an idea of when to call you, what time is best, and your phone number. If you can be reached, Steve will call you back and get with you immediately. And he can still get the physical silver and gold while it's still available, while you can still get food, buy it. Anyway, back now to another subject that I'm talking about because it all ties in. And here I'm going to read this uh, and, and uh, sen uh, censor just a little bit, uh, sanitize it for names, etc. Stephen Hawk, this is uh, Mr. Uh, a here from Waynesville, North Carolina. Please read this email about a convoy of Russian troops being stopped several months ago trying to enter Tennessee as they're headed for Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Said I am uh, I'm somebody who is in uh, Gatlinburg uh, nearly every week, and Stephen Hawk, the entire town of Gatlinburg has a very large population of young Russian and Ukrainian people working in restaurants and stores in Gatlinburg. I see them every week. They're rather rude and curt and keep to themselves. They seem to be in positions of management. Almost every day, we here in Haywood County have low-flying C-130 cargo transport planes flying directly over Lake uh, Junaluska, headed northeast. There are also Apache helicopters. And then he said, would you like me to send pictures? Yes, of course. Uh, one hel Apache flew at low altitude right over the Walmart in Waynesville, North Carolina, and we see them there daily. Waynesville is about 60 miles from Gatlinburg and even shorter by air. Waynesville is one of my favorite towns. Uh, in the Carolinas, and I used to love to drive through there, and I have taken that trip back and forth between Gatlinburg and uh, Waynesville in the past years, and that country is so beautiful, and I have seen the United Nations signs of the Greater Smoky Mountain Park. Now, he says, Hawk, Steve, I believe these troops are being airlifted into a remote area. The Russian troops of the Smoky Mountain National Forest in the upper northeast quadrant of the park. I talked with a U.S. park ranger who said he had been a ranger for 28 years and had never been through this desolate area. And then he basically said there's a map. If you go up there to the northeast quadrant, 
Uh, one of the possibilities said these troops are at is off the Appalachian Trail in the Mount Sterling Balsam Mountain Range, and I'm familiar with that area as well. Another massive remote area is in the lower southwest corner of the park, just north of the Fontana Dam in the High Rocks area. Yes, both these areas have no trails in or out of them, and seasoned park officials know nothing about them. The sheriff of Buncombe County, Asheville, North Carolina, also announced that there are some 30,000. The sheriff of Buncombe County said there are 30,000 Russians. 30,000 Russians living in the Avery's Creek area of Buncombe County. He says, I want people to know that every word Hawk is saying about the Russians is completely true, and if anything, is understated. Simply go to Gatlinburg and see them for yourself. The DHS convoy manned by Russian troops in this email was stopped by an elite state militia coming into Tennessee from Kentucky. Haywood County, North Carolina is mentioned prominently in uh, uh, Dr. Bill Forstian's that's William S. Forstian, William R. Forstian, the book One Second After Forge Press, One Second After William S. Forstian, F-O-R-S-T-C-H-E-N, who we've talked about many times on air. William S. Forstian must know something as local hunters are frequently escorted by armed men with automatic weapons dressed in camo out of an area in Haywood County, North Carolina, called Sunburst. Sunburst in Haywood County, North Carolina, off Highway 215, headed towards Brevard, North Carolina. Also, it is a well-known fact that a massive underground city exists in Transylvania County, the next county over from Haywood in the Lake Toxaway area. People can't even get uh, close to this installation. Some have disappeared trying. Yes, I've heard that as well. Apparently, these state militias have been formed in 22 states in response to Obama trying to deploy the National Guard overseas in violation of federal law, and there seems to be a silent coup d'etat occurring in this country, and like everything else, the dumb American people know nothing about it. Uh, brother, thank you for a wonderful thing. Now, let me tell you something there, uh, Mr. AP, and I would tell you this, that uh, in today's comms, Today's uh, HF military comms, there was one thing uh, that I was looking at in a radio designator, in a radio designator, and it was a regional specific call. And in that radio designator, it had TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority. And I'll tell you what, I got the sense uh, from discussing this with other people and with, with, uh, uh, radio hobbyists around the world and basically that information I think was specific to that area and it would go right in there with those dams from Fontana Dam up in that area on down into the Tennessee Valley and, you know and then you go into you know uh, down in there near Nashville and then you go in where they built the water up for all of the uh, nuclear power stuff there and Alcoa and all that kind of stuff. And I'm going to tell you, if you took out the TVA dams or some of the major works, I believe that dam that you're talking about there, not too far from you, I believe that's a Duke Power dam, or it used to be. It was Duke Power. Duke Power had that. It's right on the Tennessee, uh, North Carolina line or very near it in that high rock country. And I'll tell you, it's just incredible, you know, um, all of that stuff and all those dams that are up in there. If you knock out that, you take away the power, and that would cause in the whole southeastern part of the United States and then on up into, uh, uh, you know, the east coast uh, and then, you know, down uh, also you, you can go up uh, north from that because there's so much power that's generated you know, all those TVA dams and all that, those dams, and even the ones in Alabama and all that stuff, all of that would take the grid down by itself. And with all those Russians there, uh, what I understood to be this radio designator, and uh, 
you know, I'm not going to read all this stuff on the air and tell all the things, but let me just say that the TVA is in it and that I got the sense that they were searching from a spacecraft. They were searching down with sensing devices, trying to watch either people, say Russians or anybody else, and they're just looking for any kind of nuclear material, any kind of explosive material that would go boom, 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 and take out a dam, and they just happen to be working that TVA, that Tennessee Valley area. So let me tell you, there are good people that are still up there. Uh, Steve had a contact from one today, and let me just let me put it this way. Uh, uh, you know, uh, here's what this individual had to say, and I'm not going to give his name because I believe he is somebody who is a really good, let's just say, military person of a high degree of skill. And he says basically this, the psychopaths have zero love and 100% contempt for we, the mighty men and women of valor. He says, Steve, people are waking up, and now it's they're waking up by the hour, not the week. And he says, my name is such and such. And uh, he says, with Jesus at my side, I simply cannot lose. But he also talks about whenever they talk about uh, Steve Quayle, and they talk about him, uh, let's say on the radio, or I'll even say on packets and burst transmitters, that whenever they mention Steve's name, they all of a sudden have interference with their communication. Well, you see, when you tell the truth to the American people about what's going on, when you try to warn them about the tyranny coming down and how the Luciferians want to install the total tyranny on the planet and take it even further into blood sacrifice, you have the Joker Tut Lizard just had his power restored in court to be able to permanently put you in an indefinite basis into a concentration camp. The NDAAA. National Defense Authorization Act, which uh, part of it was stripped out or blocked, that has been removed in the court of law, and the power for the executive branch or the Joker Tut Lizard to put you in a concentration camp in an indefinite basis solely at his whim has been restored. So you see, ladies and gentlemen, this stuff is just evincing as design just like the Declaration of Independence said. Let me read it because it's better to read it. Went a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object. Evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism. It is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. <coughs> Declaration of Independence is the law of the land. Ladies and gentlemen, the Attorney General, who's supposedly the highest law enforcement officer, has denied the right to self-defense and saying there's no right. You then have the NAACP following, and I'm going to speak very carefully here. The NAACP might as well have been using Mr. Lynch's, Mr. Lynch's proscriptions of how to manage slaves via the divide and conquer rule. Mr. Lynch, how he utilized this, this little rule book that he had of how to con maintain agitation amongst different classes of slaves to divide and conquer them to make sure that you could then control them easily. So what you have is, is the Sharptons, the Holders, who have armed bodyguards. I would like to see you try to get into or go into the property of Al Sharpton's house or his condo or whatever. My bet is you would get five plugs, you know, five boom, 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 right in the old dead center mass and in the head from whatever armed security he's got. Holder certainly is Attorney General. He's running with a lot of armed security. So the fact is, 
these guys want to do what Mr. Lynch did to control his slaves and then sold the book and gave it to other plantation holders. Now, there's many African Americans that listen to this show, and they don't disagree with Old Hawk most on much, much of anything. The fact is, is this, is that those people precluded, and then the Klan after the Civil War made sure that the guns were taken from people in New York City, in the major cities, and taken that blacks did not have guns. And then in the South, where for years and years and years, there was racial segregation and there was oppression of the black people. No doubt and question about it. Okay? No doubt and question about it. But the fact is, is that that stuff is done. And then now, you want to then make it to where a black woman or man in their home or around their property in Florida or anywhere else, because they can't do it in New York or Chicago, because if you have a gun legally there, they're in, you're in trouble. You're a felon. You can't defend your property. You have to retreat. And if a bad man comes in your house, you can't even touch him. You need to retreat. So who is weakening the black people in the United States but the NAACP? Who is weakening you if you will not allow a black family or a white family or a Hispanic family or a Chinese or a Japanese or a Korean, an Asian family, an American Indian, you know, family, whatever it might be, Eskimos, Pacific Islanders, E-I-E-I-O. You do not allow for a natural right that God has given you to defend yourself and defend and protect your family. And if somebody breaks into a house or somebody is going to do you bodily harm or is threatening to kill you or is starting to punch you, or and for these guys who don't get it, I'd like for somebody to show them, and they could volunteer for demonstrations and let somebody who is 17 years old, just get a, get a tough high school kid, you know, football, basketball player, baseball player, soccer player. Let's just get a 17-year-old kid, and then they could volunteer, these politicians, these doctors, all these liberal claptrap people on the TV, let them... Let this 17-year-old high school kid or girl, we could even get a 17-year-old girl, let that person then volunteer to have their head slammed against the concrete, slammed against the concrete eight, nine, ten times, and then ask them whether they thought they were going to die or not. Because I'll tell you what, I've had my head slammed against the concrete, and I may have, I may have, I may have in a dream, in a fantasy world, I may have slammed somebody's head against the concrete once or twice. I just don't recall. It could have been on a movie that I watched. I don't know. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I'm awfully angry because of this thing, because we had a beautiful country. And I thought even up into the 90s when the prosperity was starting to get more widespread and then you had low unemployment rates and everything was going pretty well and everybody was working, everybody was able to buy a house. And you see... The problem is not that. The problem is removing the jobs, removing the automobile plants that build automobiles for the entire world <coughs> that were in and around Detroit, Michigan, or Chicago, Illinois, or, or South Bend, Indiana, or Kansas City, Missouri, or St. Louis, Missouri, that were in and around you know, other cities as well. But those are just some that I know where they took out huge amounts of people making automobiles or making car parts or whatever. In manufacturing, in jobs that were living wage jobs. You see, the average wage almost anymore in a factory in the United States may be close to seven fifty to eight fifty an hour. Yes. Because you take into account light manufacturing, smaller towns, rural areas, where they put plants, they may only pay seven, eight, nine bucks an hour. 
minimum wage in some cases, which is eight, eight and a quarter in some places. So the fact is, back in the 50s, the person, the average person that worked in a factory worked, made a lot more than that. Back then you could live on it. You had a decent car that you get a car every two, three years. You had a small house, maybe a bungalow or something, but you had one. And you can make payments on it. Your kids had clean clothes, decent shoes. You went to church on Sunday. You went to temple Saturday night, whatever it was, Friday on Saturday, Friday night. You know, the fact is you could earn the living. There was freedom to go and start your own business, become a contractor, do whatever it is you wanted to do. You could still get into union programs or, you know, and get into programs for uh, apprenticeships, for electrician, uh, you know, uh, carpentry, uh, uh, whatever it might be. You can become a coal miner. You can do a lot of different things, but you can feed your family. You could work retail and rent a place, small house or apartment, and start a family, and you can live off a retail salary or wage, and you can make it okay in America. And America was beautiful. And, you know, after World War II, we had 76% of the industrial output of the, I think, of the entire planet. No, excuse me, 56% of the industrial output of the whole planet. And now that's all in China. Detroit needs to tell them, bring the factories back for General Motors, Chrysler. Bring them back from Mexico. Bring them back from China. Put them back in Detroit. Put them back in Chicago. Put them back in Kansas City. Ladies and gentlemen, don't go into their loose period night without a fight. Your country is being destroyed. Your future is being destroyed. Stick with the Lord Jesus. Stick with the Bill of Rights. Mighty men and women of honor, I thank you for what you do. Them old Fandango Rangers, I know you're ready to dance. And the Miggy Lapu, I know you're high and dry and in the cool. But you dialed in and cold, stone cold.